Good. Welcome to our third official live stream. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Uh, so the way that this is going to work is uh, we're going to be talking here uh, so you can see and hear us. Uh, if you have a question for me or for Matt, you can post it in the questions channel uh, in the Discord. Uh, if you put a question mark, that helps me identify which ones are questions and which ones are comments. Um, if you are planning to add comments or have a conversation, uh, there's also a chat. So please take those conversations there. I uh, would appreciate it. Just makes it easier for me to find the questions. Uh, so we'll start off with uh, any questions that you have. Feel free to start posting them in the questions chat. And then uh, in maybe five, 10 minutes, I'll start the um, uh, monetization discussion. Um, and that's going to work a little different this time around than in previous. Um, I'd actually like to open up for discussion because um, this is something that uh, some members of the community seem to feel very strongly about. And so I wanted to make sure that we are uh, addressing those concerns. Um, so I'll do my presentation, and then we'll open the floor. And if you want to speak afterwards, um, either in the chat or uh, actually over voice, just raise your hand, put a little wave in the chat, and I will call on you uh, in order. And uh, we can have a conversation that way. So if you've got questions, go ahead and start adding them to the chat. And if not, Matt and I can just hang out. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, Matt, what was the um, collaboration video that you were just filming? Well, it was actually for his course. So yeah, I, I just filmed this. Uh, well, I, I guess I, miss, I, I made a guest appearance on Ken, Ken, one of Ken Cannon's Japanese learning courses. Uh, some of you guys might know Ken Cannon. He had like a viral video 10 years ago where he talked about learning Japanese. He basically stumbled across a really similar method as, you know, refold and, and ajet and stuff so in a way it was really similar to what we were doing now i basically gave a little just talk about input learning and immersion learning and then there was q and a's so that's why i have my nice fancy camera out right now is because like in the past couple uh a live streams maybe you guys noticed i was just using my crappy webcam with, didn't have my lighting set up but made a guest appearance thought i should look nice and now my stuff's all out so just kept it out Nice. Cool. Um, so we have a question from Chris Pickles. Um, what is the plan for sustaining Refold financially while also keeping the freeness of language learning true? Um, so this is actually exactly what the presentation is going to be on. So if nobody has any other questions to start off with, I'm happy to just jump into that. Um, but I wanted to give folks an opportunity to uh, you know, get some questions answered, um, whatever they are. Um, actually, there was a question from a few days ago that someone posted in preparation for this, so I'll ask that one first. Um, so Cosmic Gardening asked, uh, is a sentence, uh, a sentence audio repetition system like Glossica potentially effective? And if so, at what stage would something like that fit in? Uh, I mean, I'm not that familiar with Glossica, so it's hard to, to really say, but I mean, I think there's probably a lot of overlap with something like that and refold stage two, because I, I'm assuming that the point of that is building up your comprehension in the language. It's not really for output. And I don't think Glossica in, in, in their kind of framework, there is a portion where you specifically study vocab and grammar like there is for refold. But if you're going to try to combine refold with something like Glossica, it'd probably be stage two. But the thing is, in Refold, the, the SRS content comes from your own personal immersion content. And so that's why I think it's, it's more ideal than something like Glossica, where you're just getting standard stock sentences that you have no personal connection to. They didn't come from a, a context that you, that you actually were consuming. And so I guess it would kind of replace sentence mining. But in my opinion, it would be less optimal because the sentences aren't, aren't handpicked by you and personalized to your what's relevant to you in your current learning process. Cool. Um, Brent asks, Matt, what do you feel you might be doing if your YouTube channel hadn't become what it did? I mean, it's really hard to say because I would be something like, I'd be doing something completely different. 
So maybe I would have started learning programming and become a programmer. Uh, maybe I would have like had nothing else I wanted to do and become a Buddhist monk. I mean, it's, it's really hard to say, but my whole like current lifestyle and, and the way I live my life is totally defined by the fact that I happen to become like an online content creator. And so many, there's been so many like cascading, you know, decision tree branches that have brought me to where I am right now. So it's really hard to say what I would be doing if, if, if this, you know, I took a different pathway all the way back then. But I will say yeah. that, but until I kind of started taking this path, I had really not been thinking very seriously about my career because I was just so busy getting good at Japanese. So I used to think that I wanted to be a translator maybe, but I don't think I would have really followed through with that because I don't actually think I, I enjoy or like translation. So it probably would have been something unrelated to language. And because my whole life revolves around language, I have no idea what that'd be. Cool. Uh, Hawk asks, I'm about 90% through the Tango N5 deck. Is it worth switching to the new deck? And if so, uh, why so late in the process? I don't think so, because the real point of the deck is to bypass RRTK. So, you know, RRTK is this the this portion of the learning process, which is really one of the first things you're doing besides learning Hiragana and Katakana, where you're learning kanji out of context. You're not learning vocabulary, you're just learning kanji. And so for a lot of people, this is boring, and it just feels like they have to spend these this couple months doing this thing that's that's kind of learning Japanese, but it's also kind of not learning Japanese because it, it's not directly contributing to their comprehension that much. And so there's just this, this really boring sense of like, oh man, when can I just get on to the real fun stuff? So the real benefit with this new deck, the uh, JP1K, is that you get to start the real fun stuff right from day one, and you're building kanji recognition in this totally different way. And so if you've already finished RTK, well, you've already you already did the thing that the new deck is supposed to have to save you from doing. So there's not really that much room left for you to benefit from it. And so now if you've gone through RTK, then you probably already have good country recognition abilities, which means now it's just a matter of learning vocab. And from a purely vocab learning perspective, I think the Tongo decks are still superior to the new JP1K because they come with example sentences and sentence audio, whereas the JP1K deck right now, it only is individual isolated words, which isn't isn't detrimental. I think it's, it's just fine, but it's even better to have sentences. So because the kanji benefit of the JP1K isn't relevant to you if you finished RTK, then it's better to go with the, the Tongo decks because they have sentences. Cool. Kleptomanta. Just a basic one. Do you guys know of many real world examples of people getting fluent with a more relaxed input learning approach around two hours a day of immersion? Personally, I don't know of anyone who didn't do significantly more than that per day. Wait, did he say it in real life or, or did my brain just add that in? Uh, are you aware of, aware of any real world examples oh, of people I getting see, fluent with two hours a day of immersion? Um, I mean, I kind of interviewed a guy on my channel a couple months ago who reached basic fluency in Spanish and it sounded like he was never maybe besides a some short period towards the end he, he sounded like he was doing two hours or less I'm pretty sure so th that would be an example but I, I think it it's going to be harder to find with Japanese and it just so happens that most of the Japanese most of the immersion learners I know are learning Japanese so I think that's why I think once we once there's more people in the immersion learning community who are learning European languages, it'll start to be a lot more common story that we hear. Yeah, to, to add on to that one, um, that was a really good interview. He learned Spanish in about 10 months um, and got to basic conversational fluency. Um, uh, he was doing sort of a half study, half immersion approach, um, and then started outputting about, what, like six or seven months in? I think so. I um, too well on so, and he could speak reasonably well. So uh, it, it's it's definitely possible for the easier languages, though I think that's probably a, a odd case. Um, I, I wouldn't expect that to be typical. I think what, what we might start hearing uh, more about with Japanese and Chinese is people went through a, a, a couple year period of just doing two hours a day, and then they did a year of hardcore immersion and that got them to fluency. And I think that that's... Uh, probably what's going to be a more realistic path for people where they have this long period where they're building up their potential and then they 
you know, take some time off work or something and go all in for a year, and then that gets them to a really good spot. All right. Uh, Scott is once again asking about monetization, um, specifically around building a link style platform with a better Anki integration. Um, and I don't know if you have thoughts on this, Matt, but I definitely do. <laughs> I mean, if, if we were going to build a whole platform, we probably would get rid of Anki and we'd just build our own SRS into it. Yeah. So, I mean, Anki isn't good enough for the general public, so it needs to be replaced at some point. Um, yeah, Scott, uh, I'm going to do some conversation about this, and I'm happy to open the floor and get more thoughts on this later, but um, we can we can talk about it more in a little bit. Um, so there's still some people typing questions, but I think I can just jump into my presentation about monetization, um, a potential monetization route that I was thinking of. Um, and the reason that I want to present this is because there's a lot of people who have strong feelings about um, wanting the content to be free. They want language learning to be free. And so I wanted to address those concerns um, and explain sort of the, the perspective that we're coming from and uh, why we need to think about this pretty hard now and start making some decisions um, in, in the near future. Um, so let me do a presentation. Can you see that? <laughs> Great. All right. So let's start with what is our purpose? Um, so our stated mission is uh, demolish the language barrier. And that means we want to make language learning as straightforward as possible. We want to make sure that everybody has access to the knowledge that they need, uh, the tools that they need, and the content that they need in order to become fluent. Um, so that's our stated mission statement. There's a lot of stuff that we want to build. Uh, so we want to build guides for every language. We want to build that library of contents. We want to build specific immersion plans um, and help people design their own day-to-day -day immersion plans. Um, and then we also want to build tools for each of the languages. So today we launched the uh, Japanese 1K deck, and we'd like to build a starter deck for every language um, so that when newcomers come to the community, they can get uh, a running start. Um, and then there's all sorts of other software that we are considering building in order to help accelerate the learning process. Uh, and then, of course, motivational guides. This is something that I did not realize there was such demand for. But after the poll on Friday, there was a, a lot of votes for motivational guides. So it seems like that's you know, very um, desired within the community. So the, the challenge that we have is that all of those things that I just listed is that's an enormous amount of content to create. Uh, that is way more content than Matt or I can do alone, unfortunately, um, especially for things that are not in languages that he and I know. Like He can do Japanese. I can probably do Spanish. But beyond that, we're going to need to hire uh, domain experts for every language. Um, so we will need someone to come in to teach us about Arabic. Um, and to help us design that guide. Or uh, Mandarin, we'll probably need to bring somebody in, Korean, et cetera. Um, we're also gonna need to bring in writers, video editors, um, software engineers, uh, because we want to start building this, um, this machine of a business or of an organization that can continue to turn out more content than Matt and I can do alone. So that is the... Uh, perspective that I'm coming at the from, from, I want to be able to build this machine so that it can start to turn out the content that's necessary for the community. So in order to make that happen, we need revenue. Um, and so there, we have to put something behind a paywall. 
because right now with the, so far we've released mostly free stuff and it just hasn't really driven the revenue that we want it to. Um, so for an example, we released the new deck today and we got 50 subscriptions, 50 new patrons just today. Um, and that doesn't even count people who include and in, increase their, um, their monthly subscription in order to uh, get access to that deck. So it, it's pretty clear that people are willing to pay for it. Um, and we wanna make sure that we are capitalizing that so that we can collect that and then reinvest it back into Refold. So there's um, three pretty straightforward options. Um, and these were suggested by people in the chat actually um, as potential options for how to gain the revenue of the new content, but also uh, make sure that the content eventually becomes free at some point. Um, so one option is what a lot of companies do where the, some portion of their content is free and some portion of their content is paid and it's that way forever. Um, a lot of people don't like that idea because they, they want all the stuff to be free eventually. The other option is we um, put things behind a paywall for a specific period of time. Uh, let's say it's a year. So from the uh, date that we publish it or that we publish it to our community, our internal community, our, our patron community, um, it would be part of that for a year before going public. And that would give us an opportunity to have people pay for the content until it goes public and then uh, it would be free for everyone. Um, and then the other way to do that is instead of time-based, we do it based on a revenue goal or a patron goal. Um, and so Patreon has uh, patron goals built in. So those are three pretty straightforward options. But uh, the other day I came up with an idea that is more complicated, but I got pretty excited about it. Um, and so what I wanted to do was present it to you all and get your thoughts on it to see if this is actually a good idea or if I'm just uh, you know, running away with my ideas. Um, so before we you know, invest any resources whatsoever into building this, uh, I wanna make sure that it's something that this community actually wants. So the idea is content voting. Um, and what that means is we would make a list of all of the content that we wanna create. Um, so all those things that I just mentioned a few, um, a few slides ago, we would list out everything in detail. And then uh, any new ideas that come from the community, we would put into that list. Then every patron for every dollar that they contribute uh, to Refold, they would get a, a vote that they can contribute towards some piece of content. So if someone cares a lot about creating a, um, a starter deck for Mandarin, then they can contribute all of their points or their, their votes towards that. Um, so if they're a $10 patron, like you'd be on this call, then um, they would have 10, uh, 10 votes per month that they could contribute towards uh, the deck. And then we would look at the numbers and the votes per piece of content. And that's how we would decide which content to create first. Um, we would you know, also have to be strategic about it. We can't only do that. We need to make sure that we're looking forward and not just at our current community. But uh, it would give us an opportunity to know what people want and to build what people want the most. Um, then once something is built, um, there would be another use for those votes. So we would build, let's say the stage one Japanese guide and we would put a price on it. We would say, say a thousand votes. Once um, this guide gets a thousand votes to make it public, that's when we make it public. So the folks in the community who are really, really driven by the desire to make things public, um, they could put all of their votes just towards making things public and not towards the content. Uh, and that would be a way for us to um, provide a path towards uh, making things public while also gaining revenue along the way and making sure that the people who want to make things public can contribute to that and the ones who don't care about that can contribute to content instead. So we're trying to meet everybody's goals in some capacity. Um, so the idea behind that uh, I just went through is the benefits that you would get from being a patron are um, you would get access to content, you would be able to influence our content plans and you would help make content go public. 
Um, and for people who really care about making content go public, one of the goals is to provide a pathway to make that happen. The challenges with this is uh, we're, we would have to build this system. Uh, this doesn't currently exist in any um, in any capacity that I am aware of. It's not something that we could buy. We would have to build it. And so any resources that we invest, whether it's money or time uh, or energy, uh, that takes away from the content that we would be creating. Um, so you know, I would have to put a pause on all of my content work in order to work on the site for a month or two to build this thing. Um, the other challenge is that the Japanese community outnumbers all the other communities by about eight to one. And so their votes are going to be uh, pretty aggressively skewing the results. So uh, we would have to keep in mind um, which votes are going towards Japanese things versus which the votes aren't, and that we would need to set aside time to work on things even though they don't have as many votes as the Japanese things. Uh, we would just need to take that into consideration. So that is the general idea. Um, so the question that I have for the group here is, is it a good idea? Should I keep trying to pursue it and trying to lay it out? Um, or is it overly complicated? We should just stick with something simpler and not worry about this. Uh, do you think that this is a cool idea that would actually um, gain more subscribers just because of what it is, regardless of all the rest of the content? Um, so I want to open it up to discussion. So if you are interested in um, speaking in the chat uh, or speaking in the Google Meet, uh, put a little wavy hand um, in the uh, let's do it in the let's do it in the chat channel rather than the questions channel, just to keep that. Um, actually, change my mind. Put it in the question channel. Put a little wavy hand. Um, otherwise. You can, if you don't want to speak, then just um, put your comments in the thread, uh, and I'm going to read and respond to them as they come in. Uh, so we got some discussion about it being a good idea. All right, we've got Prigtopia wants to speak, so go ahead. Hello. Hi there. Uh, yeah, I think this is a really cool idea. I think it would drive additional uh, community participation. I know I joined this entire community fairly recently, uh, and it's this would definitely be something that kept me motivated to stay involved in the community, especially if I started making content for it or contributing in some other way. Uh, I think it, I, I think it's perfectly fair to say, like, if you have a voting system, it can't be uh, it can't be the only thing that drives creation of content. Otherwise, Japanese is just going to run away with it and eat all your time all the time. But I think that that strategy needs to be, I don't know. In some way, more transparent, if that makes sense. So we need to be transparent about the things that we were choosing to create that were not aligned with the vote tallies. Yeah, just as a, just as a, like upfront, being like, yes, these are the votes. They go on the list. They go on the list in the queue. But uh, we're always going to be working. You're always going to be working on additional content for more than just the languages. Right. Um, and I cool. think, and yeah, uh, next up. OK. <laughs> Thanks for your comments. Uh, Cosmic Gardening, you're up. Looks like their mic is not working. So Vulcan, you're up. Uh, Hello. Mic is working. Sorry. Oh. Okay. okay you can go first. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I just wanted to basically say this uh, something similar to what the person just before me said, which is that I, I think that yeah, the in terms of your product management, I mean, 
at the at the end of the day, while it is a community that you're trying to support, like it, it's your products, right? So you need to you need to figure out your priorities for how that content is going to be split. And I think that saying having the community have visibility into community driven projects and maybe calling them like community driven projects or something like that um, will make it clear that those priorities are distinct from like your priorities of wanting to be able to have content in other languages because I, I think it's clear that also from a business perspective long term you, you want to be able to say like we support Portuguese or we support Italian we support all these different communities because uh, while Japanese is overrunning everything and while I am learning Japanese it's it's a legitimate concern for like market space going forward that you don't have Japanese become so heavy of a focus that you kill your other communities by accident, right? Um, so I'm done, sorry. No, that's a great point. Um, and it's absolutely something that we would have to uh, keep in mind. Um, when I first proposed this idea to Matt, uh, I was thinking, you know, 50% of our time towards whatever has the most votes and 50% of our time towards strategic um, initiatives that like we think we want to look forward into the future. What are the uh, communities that we want to build? What other languages do we want to break into? Um, so trying to divide our time that way. Um, but I appreciate the perspective. All right, Vulcan, you're up. Hi, uh, so I think the idea is like, has merit to it. But one thing that I think might be a good idea is to <clears throat> kind of open the discussion to people that aren't currently Patreons uh, supporters so that we can actually bring people that aren't, you know, behind a money wall into the community so that there's, you know, more tools that are being created. And, you know, there would be more people voting within the community to get make those tools public as well. So I think it would be kind of a chain reaction. So I thought it'd be kind of interesting if you, you know, opened up similar polls to the ones you discussed, but to the, you know, Discord servers for people that aren't on the Patreon to vote on, and maybe even have some voting mechanism where they can give you an indication of how much money they think it would be worth to them to join the Patreon. So like, they like this idea that you have that could be behind a paywall and, to join the Patreon, they would be willing to pay this much money. So then you could like prioritize things with uh, a lot of votes and kind of have an idea of like how that will affect the community. Cause the people that are voting for those are like willing to pay for them and it would right. just help the community grow faster. And cause we're already paying already, you know? Right. So we might not be like the only audience that you should be considering. No, you're 100% right. That's definitely a fair point. Um, we, we will definitely need to get buy-in from the existing community. Um, I, I can you know break this into three groups. There's people who are already patrons, people who are um, in the community but not patrons, and then people who are not yet in the community. And so we definitely need to understand the motivations of all those, but we have access to that second group. Um, and we can definitely learn more about what they want and incorporate that into whether you know this is actually a good idea uh, before we try and build anything. Um, and even without building anything, you're right, we can get content um, and tooling, uh, try to assess the amount of demand for different content and tools um, we, from our existing community, even without building a tool to do that, we can just send out a poll, so. Yeah, yeah, and the last fun. thing I'll add is that uh, it'd come in at a fair price to them too. If they had an option to say what they'd be willing to pay, I think that would provide information for you, not only in like how it would affect Refold to accept, uh, to like develop that tool financially, mm -hmm. but also the people who like join the Patreon for that tool would be satisfied uh, because it'd be like an average of their votes maybe for how much they think it's worth to them. Yeah, no, that's a great idea. Cool. Um, Victor had a question. How do you choose the price of each item? Uh, would the price for creating something uh, the same be the same as the price for making it public? Would it be less, more? It seems like it might be tricky to keep the economy balanced in general. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I don't have an answer for you, unfortunately. Uh, it really depends on uh, 
I, I think what we would have to do is try and estimate the amount of votes that would go towards making something public and then try and estimate um, sort of how long we expect it to be in that realm. It also depends on whether we like group things together. So uh, let's say we have stage one guide, but we have um, the deck for a certain language be a separate voting. There's so many different ways to arrange it. Uh, you're right, keeping the economy balanced would be a challenge. And it's something that I don't have a strong understanding of right now. So I can't really speak to how that pricing would work. Uh, DJ D Dog, you're up. Hey, can everybody hear me? Yep. yep. Okay, cool. All right. So uh, first, I think it's a kick-ass idea. Um, I mean, obviously, I you know there's a need for monetization just from a business standpoint of production value and what you can all turn around and uh, you know put put out more content. Right? You're going to get more people to join. So I think that's a great idea. On that uh, I guess one thing just to clarify, you know, so if uh, say a person's paying you know ten dollars a month and is the votes additional money or is it i can choose how to allocate my ten dollars i'm already paying to these different categories yeah so however much money you give that's how many votes you get okay that makes sense cool that was pretty much all i have for now. great thanks for your feedback um let's see Brizzle is asking um, would it be possible to have a monthly vote between two and four things that you think would be a good priority? So it's not always Japanese dominated. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's an option. Um, we could definitely try and narrow the scope to just a couple things rather than listing literally everything. Um, and we can say, you know, these are all the things we want to create, but these are the things we're planning to create in the next few months. Um, let us know which one should go first. So that is definitely an opportunity. Um, Freetopia, wouldn't a dollar per vote be vulnerable to single time patrons dumping some money, uh, like a thousand dollars for a single thing to be public forever isn't worth the time investment, in my opinion. I need to limit votes to dollar tiers. Um, I don't really understand the question. Am I clarifying? I mean, I do think that it is vulnerable for, you know, if somebody really wants something, they can come in and just drop a thousand dollars to uh, overwhelm the vote total on it and make it public. But uh, I think that's actually more of a feature than a bug. Um, it would make it, it, it creates a marketplace in which we can sell content or we can develop content um, for hire, essentially. Um, and that's actually a model that a lot of YouTubers have used in the past where, you know, they create content and then somebody comes to them and says, um, you know, I want this specific piece of content. I will pay you a thousand dollars for it. And then they create it. Um, so I think that's actually more of a, a feature than a bug, uh, though it would definitely stomp on the community's priorities. So we would have to you know, balance those needs. Um, I think I answered your question, but if not, let me know. Uh, what are your thoughts on building an official ambassador program for micro influencers within the community? Um, Brent, are you referring to having community members start to build followings uh, as a way to build the refold brand? Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, I hadn't considered that idea, actually. Um, I'm going to write that down. Micro ambassadors. Um, yeah, I think that there is definitely an opportunity there. There's so many people who are posting their um, progress updates and starting to build followings um, of people who are watching them go through the process of immersion learning. So uh, I think that is definitely a possibility that I had not at all considered. Um, and now it's on my list to consider it. So I appreciate that. <laughs> well, actually, a similar idea that Ethan had was basically to take people who are already language learning influencers with similar methodologies and turning them into an ambassador for Refold. 
So in a way, it, it kind of sounds like actually a, an idea s- kind of similar to one Ethan had. But yeah, it, it is definitely a different idea to kind of um, build someone from the ground up rather than take someone who's already doing well, I guess, as an influencer. Yeah, I mean, I think the micro ambassadors is a, a nice way to do it because it encourages the consistent progress updates. It encourages people to get better and it, um, they also get benefit because they build their YouTube community. They can put ads and start gaining revenue from YouTube. So um, we could definitely do some sort of sharing, uh, you know, some sort of kickback for that, you know, free merch, call outs, you know, being part of the inner circle, all sorts of things. So uh, I like that idea. Thanks, Brett. Um, Scott, outside of what we think is best, what do the two of you actually want to do to monetize in the long term? Yeah, so I, I was planning to talk more about this in the next live stream, but the basic premise for the long-term monetization uh, is something that I mentioned last time. Um, So we've got this free community now, and the best thing that we can do right now is to get as many people in the free community to fluency, just to demonstrate that this works. Once we have something that works, we can take that and show it to businesses. And if we can demonstrate to businesses that it's effective, there are so many businesses out there that are um, desperate for uh, teaching their uh, employees languages, or they are desperate for um, people who speak languages. So um, professionals who want to learn and businesses, they just want an all-in-one product. They don't want to figure all this stuff out. So we can create an all-in-one product that is premium just for them. And then once we've demonstrated that it works with businesses, then that allows us to break into um, government institutions like schools um, or any other aspect of government. Um, but we need to build that track record of results before anybody will take us seriously. So that's the long-term monetization. Um, and the hope is that the business government, that side would be lucrative enough that we could continue to make the free content that would, um, and support the free content so that, uh, the average Joe who, you know, doesn't have several thousand dollars a month to spend on language learning, um, can still learn. And so we want to make sure that we're building up our, our free resources as much as possible so that um, the average person can still learn um, and, and take those and, and run with them. Cool. Uh, Kleptomanta, would you even need to limit it to Patreons? Patrons, rather. Um, if there's enough public demand through one off donations, would that be valid? Yeah, I mean, I think one off demand or one off donations would be fine. You can do that through. Um, Patreon, the patrons um, aspect is more about like getting access to premium content while it's still premium uh, before it becomes public. So I think either of those work entirely. Uh, Pritok is clarifying, limiting vote count to tiers would group the votes better, easier to estimate and manage. Um, yeah, I'm still not understanding what that means. <laughs> I think, Sorry. I think what, what they mean is that, like, so for example, if you want to, you can donate $1,000 a month to us, right? So under your system, that means you would get 1,000 votes. And I think they're saying, oh, well, if the highest tier on Patreon is is the $20 tier, then it sh- no one should get, no individual should be able to buy more than 20 votes. Otherwise, an individual has the potential to completely overthrow the, the voting system. But you kind of answered, uh, a couple minutes ago that actually that's in a way a a feature not a bug because in the case that some guy just comes in pays us a thousand bucks and overrides the voting system that's a thousand bucks that we wouldn't have had otherwise if it wasn't for this person so it's kind of like it's just an additional thousand dollars above our bottom line in that case which is pretty beneficial for reform yeah um and i just want to like put some relative numbers on this. I meant to say this during the presentation, but I, I forgot to say it. Um, just so you all understand the, the, the scale of what we're talking about, um, if we 10 extra revenue, if we multiplied our current revenue by 10, we would be able to hire about four people. So um, we have a lot of growing to do before we get to a place where we can like really build the infrastructure that we need in order to churn out content um, really aggressively. So um, that is sort of where I'm coming from the from in this conversation. Uh, Geo Spiral is asking intermediate Mandarin learner here. What strategy should I? Oh, we're back to questions. Um, 
Mandarin, what strategy should I use when reading content online? Should I read everything first, then go back for unknown words, search up every new word I come across in the spot, etc.? Well, on Refold, we make this distinction between intensive immersion and free flow immersion. Free flow immersion is when you're not really looking anything up, you're kind of just going with the flow. Uh, you're, you're kind of in a more relaxed state, your attention isn't as hyper focused. And you might be looking some things up here or there, but for the most part, you're just getting what you get. And then we also have intensive immersion, where you're looking up most of the things you don't know, you might be sitting and thinking a little bit about a lot of the sentences, I'm um, trying to figure it out. So we talk about the, you know, how you should like how much intensive versus how much free flow should you be doing based on what stage you're at and what your goals are all on the refold site. So you can check that out then. But yeah, uh, I mean, the expl I think the answer to your question is kind of inherent in the explanations of the two different types of immersion. But if you're doing intensive immersion, look lots of things up as you go. And if you're doing free flow, then you're not really looking anything up unless something just really calls your attention and you just have really strong curiosity to find out what something means. Cool. Thanks, Geospiral. Uh, the next two questions are both about merch. Do we have merch? Uh, not yet. <laughs> Matt and I were talking about it this week. Um, I was planning to look into it on Saturday and trying to get it set up this month. So there will be merch. Um, there's this first round of merch, which is just going to be the refold colors. Um, but I have seen requests for uh, language specific refold merch in the future. So using the icons with the flags uh, so that uh, I guess people want, you know, the Spanish one or the Cantonese one or the Russian one, et cetera. So there's definitely an a lot of opportunity for merch in the future. Uh, Vulcan is saying, I think it is better to limit the votes to monthly pledged here. Uh, that way you pay anyway and not an additional payment. If you pledge additional money and the vote doesn't go your way, it could brew toxicity within the community, especially if they aren't within the community and you take discretion in choosing less popular options. I think it's a fair point. Um, if we set this up to look like a pay for play situation and somebody pays and then doesn't get the content that they want in the time frame that they want, um, then I could totally imagine that causing issues. We would definitely need to be very explicit about what the vote system means and um, that we are reserving you know, the right to do something strategic over something that serves our immediate community. Um, we might have to set up a different system where uh, if somebody wants to put in $1,000 for a specific piece of content, they have to actually like contact us uh, and we need to agree on the terms of that. So there's some options there, but uh, I, I, do, I do see the potential issues with that. Um, or maybe there should be some rule where if you are kind of going above a certain, like some sort of threshold, then you have to be hitting some kind of, of benchmark. Like, we'll only let you pay a thousand if we know that that thousand is going to be enough to, to make them go through or something like that. Like, you have to buy the whole yep. thing if, if you're going above a certain amount or something. Yeah, there's definitely different options, a lot of different factors to consider. So thank you for bringing up potential issues. Uh, these are things we definitely need to think about. So, uh, Scott is asking, have we thought about doing a large PR push? Um, so maybe Matt, you meeting with micro ambassadors to generate hype um, or to um, another option is start doing more uh, collaboration videos, trying to get talking about refold to other um, folks on YouTube. Um, the answer is no, we haven't talked about it yet, but <laughs> I don't know, Matt, if you have any initial thoughts. I mean, well, I guess my two thoughts are, um, first of all, I haven't been as active on YouTube the past couple of months, but I'm planning on just getting more active in general, and I'm probably going to plug refold in all my main channel videos. So that should generate more uh, awareness of, of refold in the general public. And the other thing is that right now we're kind of still in the phase of like creating the core content of Refold. And so probably once we have some of the more of the core content kind of created, then we, I imagine we'll, we'll naturally want to put more of our resources towards PR and um, increasing awareness. Yeah, I, I think PR is definitely something that we need to um, start working on in the near future and we're planning on it. It's just, we've been heads down working on the, the content and not really worrying too much about the PR yet. So, um, but yeah, no, it's a good point, Scott. Uh, 
Interesting. Okay, so Perctopia is suggesting that we add different tiers, so adding many different tiers for voting purposes, um, so that it becomes very clear exactly how many votes you get. Um, okay, no, that's an interesting concept. Um, I think we would need to make it very clear exactly what you get for the uh, quantity of money that you are donating. So. Uh, so that is the end of the current list of questions. So if anybody here has other questions related to the um, presentation or just related to anything at all, feel free to ask. Matt, how do you get your purple black back glow? Uh, it's, it's an uh, LED strip. And actually, I have this little remote. You can change the color. And I think there's even like a, a disco mode or something. Wait, where is it? Well, I forget how to like make it do fancy stuff. But it actually, it, it's based on infrared. And my like soft boxes that you can't see, but that are lighting my face are also infrared. So sometimes I'll like go to change one of my soft boxes and then the lights will randomly go to disco mode and it'll be really annoying. <laughs> What's a soft box? Um, this oh, right, the lights. giant, uh, actually here, the other one, will, uh, yeah, that, that thing right there. The, it. It, it basically is like a light bulb behind, um, a, uh, behind a sheet, and the sheet makes the light more dispersed so it's not as harsh on your face. Yeah, makes sense. Sumisu. Boring. Go ahead. <laughs> changing your batch purple. Uh, Sumisu is asking, uh, is there a compromise to using JP1K RRTK instead of doing traditional RTK? If someone is willing to do production RTK, are they going to get more benefit out of it? Uh, no, I don't think so. And I think this is a really common misconception. I think there is a, a lot of people think of it as a compromise, but it's really not because if you if your final goal is to be fluent in Japanese and also be a kanji master who can write out every single kanji by hand perfectly, then the fastest way to get to that point is to learn how to read Japanese fluently as quickly as possible and then do uh, direct kanji practice. So spending time trying to learn the kanji really well before you know the Japanese written language is just a, not a good use of time, in my opinion, in any scenario. Cool. Uh, Preektopia is open to helping us with building this voting system because uh, they think that there are wider applications. So uh, yeah, I mean, we're open to any help that we can get. <laughs> um, there are many volunteers who have stepped in to help us write things and uh, help us build bots. Um, and we've been really appreciative of all of those volunteers. Um, so if we were going to create this voting system and uh, we saw a potential uh, either market for it or a potential uh, for making it open source and people wanted to contribute to that, then I would certainly be open to the idea. Um, it's, it's funny, the, I told one of my friends about it earlier today and he said, oh, there's this other company doing it. Um, uh, I can't remember what they're called. They're called do, 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 Corridor Crew. They're like a visual effects and movie studio. Um, and they're doing something pretty similar where they have a, a, a premium um, service uh, and they have prices on each of their movies. And as soon as that movie gets enough votes, it goes into production. Um, so that's how they're doing their voting on content system. Um, it's, it's a neat idea. I don't know if it works. Uh, maybe I should reach out to one of them and ask. <laughs> Yeah, so I think, Matt, we should stay on probably for another 10, let's say 7, 10, and we should drop off. That work for you? Yeah. B. I do not know why my camera looks so blue. I do not know what happened. <laughs> did you change it back to purple? Uh, I, I did once, but it was like still blue. 
<laughs> also, this little remote is broken, so when you press the blue button, it doesn't become blue. So that's why I'm like randomly trying all the buttons until I find which one is like actually perfect. <laughs> this was just some super cheap twenty dollar thing I got from Amazon. Yeah, Brent is asking uh, to both of us: Has the true scale of the community set in uh, in an emotional sense? I've done some projects myself in the past, and I find it easy to dissociate the numbers that you see on screen from the people actually behind them. Um, yeah, so <laughs> this is a good question. Um, I go back and forth. Sometimes I feel like I am just, you know, going about my day doing silly things, and then sometimes I realize that there's, uh, you know, potentially five thousand people in the community who want me to do something. Um, and you know i i get you know 10 to 15 messages a day for responding to different requests or uh, various other things so um the scale in it sometimes it feels like it's set in sometimes i just feel like i'm doing customer service <laughs> so uh it's it's definitely an interesting experience it's something that i've never really experienced before so i think for me it mostly hasn't really set in because you know, as my audience has grown on YouTube and in general, you just acclimate to it immediately. And you also are looking, you're always looking up towards the next like level of people who have even more like people following them. So like my baseline is just like, oh yeah, I'm still tiny. I don't even have a hundred thousand subscribers. That's like how I feel about it most of the time. Uh, but every once in a while I will like be, be in like a room with a hundred people and then it will like dawn on me how when I see a YouTube video with a hundred views, that feels like literally nothing. And how if you like an average video of mine might get 10,000 views. And if when you think about what that would look like physically, it's a ton of people, way more people than I know. So every once in a while, I'll have a moment where it kind of sets in, but the vast majority of the time it doesn't. And like the, the other day, actually, I got a someone messaged me who I, I haven't talked to since college. And actually, even in college, I, I only like knew them once or twice, but uh, they were they were a Japanese learner. So I immediately had the thought like, oh, I bet they saw one of my videos and uh, and that's why they're messaging me. And, it, and that was the case, but it didn't feel special at all. I don't feel like, you know, like in a weird way, it's like, oh, well, if you're into learning Japanese, it's not very surprising that you would know me. Uh, if you're really into Japanese, it might be surprising if you don't know me. So in a way, that's, that is like definitely some level of, of fame, but it doesn't feel like that at all. It just feels like um, nothing special, I guess. Cool. Thanks for the question, Brent. Uh, Scott is asking, Matt, do you still ride the sweatpants with zipper pockets wave? Oh, yeah, 100%. Never going back, bro. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Sumisu asking, Matt, are you excited for your meditation retreat? How much does a meditation retreat cost, and how often do you go on them? So, yeah, I'm really excited for it, especially because... Uh, I mean, yeah, it's been a whole year since I went on a meditation retreat. I was supposed to go on like two different meditation retreats in 2020 that I didn't go on because they got canceled because of Corona. So it's yeah, it's really exciting to finally get to go back to a meditation retreat. This type of meditation retreat is actually a totally different style of meditation than everything I've done in the past. So I don't really know what it's going to be like at all. The ones I did in the past were uh, about $500, I think. And uh, it was so, but, but the one I'm doing now is actually like quite a bit more expensive than that because of just the, the lineage of the teacher. It's like a teacher with a lot of no notoriety and someone who has a, a lot of demand. Uh, and I probably wouldn't have signed up for this particular meditation retreat if it was just me, but two of my friends are doing it and we're all doing it together. So that's kind of why I decided to just go for it. Because uh, even though I don't know that much about this particular tradition, it's like a Tibetan tradition of, of meditation. Uh, that's like a little different than than like the more mindfulness type of tr meditation retreats I went on in the past. Um, but yeah, more than anything, I think since I'm doing it with my friends, it should be a really enjoyable experience. And it'll be just, yeah, nice to get out of the pattern of normal life. And, you know, because since Corona started, it's it's hard to, to not fall into a super formulaic lifestyle. But I feel like there's one other aspect of that question that I that, that he asked another like any question in there. What was it? No, I think you got oh, everything. Okay. Yeah. Oh, but I'll also uh, say well, that if you want, if you want to do a meditation retreat, uh, there's the the most 
the first thing that comes up when you type in meditation retreat are Goenka Vipassana retreats, and those are 100% free. They're all run based off donation, and you can go to them all over the world. It's not my recommended type of meditation, but if money is an issue, then that's probably uh, the best option. Cool. Uh, Vulcan is asking, Ethan, do you have a favorite contemporary Spanish novel not translated? And the answer is no. I have still not actually read a real Spanish novel. Um, I've read multiple translated books, um, and my focus recently has all been on TV. Um, but I would love to pick up an actual novel one of these days. So uh, I'm on the lookout. If you have any recommendations, please let me know. Um, there's, uh, I know that Gredwin added a whole bunch to the uh, shared Google Docs, so I was planning to pick up one of those, but um, I was also planning to just ask for recommendations whenever I had the time. Unfortunately, uh, Refold is taking up most of my time, and I, I really only get like an hour or two of, med of um, uh, immersion a day, uh, and that's if I'm lucky. So uh, most of my time is really just spent working or relaxing with free flow meditation or free flow immersion. Now I have meditation stuck in my head. <laughs> <laughs> free flow meditation sounds nice. It does, right? Uh, Scott is asking, Matt, will you watch the new Love Live when it comes out with Text Chat 1? Um, Love Live, I'm guessing. Oh, Love Live. Um, <laughs> Uh, I don't know what that is. I know Love Live, uh, the anime series. I watched it like a long time ago, uh, but I was never really a fan of idol related content. I pretty much just watched that because it was famous and I was like, just wanted to have seen all the famous shows. Um, but I don't watch that much anime anymore and I definitely am not gonna watch some idol anime. <laughs> I don't even, maybe that's not even an idol anime. Uh, maybe it's not even an anime. I don't, I don't, you said like text chat one. I don't know what that is. Uh, it's a channel in um oh in the server i see I, oh, okay that i makes think that's sense. what you're referencing <laughs> okay so i guess that means you guys are watching it together and you want me to join you but um <laughs> i think i'll have to pass um cosmic gardening asking i don't know much about ethan so i also want to ask what content he's interested in making and what he's been consuming for spanish uh yeah so i've been part of the immersion community for about uh, 14 months now. I think I found Matt uh, in November of last year. And for content that I've been consuming, uh, I have one TV show that is my intensive immersion show, and that's um, the like slice of life. I'm sentence mining everything from it, uh, trying to get to that point where I have level five comprehension. And then, um, all the rest of my immersion is just free flow enjoyment. So uh, I have, I think like five or six different TV shows that I bounce between. I have uh, Harry Potter audiobooks and Percy Jackson Kindle book. Um, and uh, the, the TV show that I'm watching is uh, Silvana Sin Lana, which has uh, become a cult classic in our Spanish community. So um, we all recommend it. Um, so that's as far that's what I'm consuming for Spanish. Uh, and then in terms of what content I am interested in in making, um, the I'm excited by all sorts of content. But for me, the why I'm here, why I'm part of Refold, is because I didn't have a path when I started learning Spanish, and it was really frustrating for me. And I spent multiple years just kind of wandering around in the dark. So my goal is to create a path so that no one else experiences that ever again that they can just look at our guide and say, oh, this is the path. And then everything else that we do is about keeping people on that path, um, making that path go faster, um, and making that path just easier to, to walk. Um, so that's sort of my mentality about uh, Refold and what we're building. Uh, another question from Cosmic Gardening. Legitimate question, have you considered targeting the VTuber audience? Um, and they say, a v are VTubers a good source of immersion? Would not be a hard script to write. Um, I mean, to be honest, I kind of have some resistance to doing that because I personally, VTubers don't appeal to me at all. And so I think it would just come across, like if I'm gonna appeal to v people who like VTubers, then I can't really say anything negative about them, right? It wouldn't really make sense. I'd have to act like I get it and I'm in on it, right? 
And in order to do that, I'd have to be really disingenuous. So, I mean, that's my kind of first response. But I don't know if uh, I know that that as a market is getting really big. So maybe we can find some other way to try to appeal to them besides just, you know, like me make, trying to make some video that that would cause me to, you know, be a little disingenuous. <laughs> and All right. are they a good source of or oh, wait? Oh, never mind. I thought when <laughs> asking the question, are VTubers a good source of immersion was in there. So at first I thought he was asking that. And then I realized, oh, no, that was just um, no, no, that was just a hypothetical suggestion. video title. <laughs> yeah. All right. I am going to close questions. Uh, this is the last one we got. Uh, though, Brent, I see that you're typing. I'll, I'll answer if you want. Um, Smithy is asking one last question for Matt. Do you still believe that meditation can help with the language learning process? And what would you recommend for somebody who wants to get into meditation? Is there an app slash book that you really like? I know you used to recommend TMI, but I don't know if you still use that. I definitely think that meditation can in, improve your ability to, to learn a language. I don't think it's nearly as dramatic as I made it sound in my initial meditation video, but really meditation is training yourself to be able to pay attention better. And the ability to pay attention better is definitely going to help you in really any pursuit in your life, but particularly any pursuit that uh, is an intellectual pursuit, which language learning kind of is, kind of isn't. But um, yeah, in terms of what I recommend getting started, yeah, I don't, I mean, the TMI or the Mind Illuminated is... Uh, it works really well for some people. It didn't work very well for me. And so for for the people who, I, I assume the people who resonate most with my content have a similar mind as me. And if that's the case, probably Mind Illuminated isn't gonna be uh, the best for them. I recommend getting started with Shins and Young's mindfulness system. And you can find a really detailed PDF of it if you, go, if you Google Shinzen, like as if it was a Japanese word, like S-H-I-N-Z-E-N, Young meditation. You can it'll, it will come up. I've heard good things about Sam Harris's app uh, for getting started, but I haven't tried it myself. And yeah, I, I liked the book Mindfulness in Plain English. I read that when I was first getting started, but it doesn't really give you a systematic framework. It kind of is just like teaches you the mindset, but it can still be helpful. But yeah, if, if you're really serious about meditation, the the stream entry subreddit is a really good resource and I think they have a lot of if you look at the sidebar of like r slash stream entry there's a ton of resources on there and that's they're uh, really legit in my opinion cool last question Brent is asking uh, any VR chat videos coming down the pipeline this year and a uh, following a follow up from that was um, that particular video is the best motivational tool for me <laughs> I wasn't planning on it to be honest because those videos are a pain in the ass to make. Uh, like I had to play VR chat for like 10 hours to get enough footage to make each of those videos. Just because I'm looking for a really specific situation that plays out in a really specific way. Like so many of the times when I reveal that I'm a that I'm an American, they don't react at all. They're just like, oh, okay, cool, cool. And then it's not interesting at all. Uh, plus, you know, there's just, there's just so many different factors that have to line up and so, and, and then editing it takes forever because then I have to look through the hours and hours of footage and edit it all together and then doing the subtitles takes forever. And so, and I don't, I'm not really passionate about those types of videos because I don't feel like anyone is learning anything from doing that. And I feel like I'm just showing off basically. I mean, I know it's motivational for people, but it mostly for me, it just feels kind of like cheap entertainment. So it's like a real grind. So. I don't know, maybe I'll do it again because of course they're my most viewed videos, but right now I have a bunch of, of more, um, like I have a bunch of video ideas that just have more substance and are you know more thoughtful, hopefully will actually be more useful to people's learning. And so I think, you know, now that I plan on starting once I get back from my meditation retreat, getting more back into making videos regularly, I think those are the things that I'll do for a while. Well, if we do this micro ambassador program, maybe somebody uh, in the community will start doing VR chat videos. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I definitely don't think you need to actually be like super high level. If you have basic fluency, I think you can, and, and you and you know how to play the game. I think you can uh, get tons of really good reactions. Cool. 
Well, that is the end of our session. Thank you everyone for attending. We really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for all of the amazing feedback that you all provided uh, on the ideas for monetization. We really appreciate really everything that you do. Um, the money is just the least of it, just your engagement with uh, with Refold and with wanting to see us succeed and us wanting to see you succeed. Um, this is just a, it's a great community to be a part of and we really appreciate having you and, and being able to be part of this community and being able to be leaders of this community. Um, we really have uh, all of you to thank. So thank you so much for uh, your time and for joining us. Yeah, thanks so much, guys.